Good evening. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, October 24th, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Scout Troop 828 in Timonium. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Pledge on the count. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you for leading us in the pledge. Oh, it's a big Boy Scout troop. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Xfinity Channel 73 and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the October 24th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any additions or changes to tonight's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and consult with staff consultants or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the, oops, wait a second. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Mr. McCaw. Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, resignations. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit D1? So moved, Pumphrey. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second from Pong. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Whoops. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call, oh, thank you, Mr. McCall. And for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Good evening, Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval this evening. Equal Employment Opportunity Officer, Office of Equal Employment Opportunity, and Supervisor, Office of Position Management and Human Resources Information System. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So move, Stileski. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Harvey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pomfrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Dr. Rogers? Thank you. Our first appointment this evening is Theodore Garrett. Theodore is attending with his wife, Melanie Garrett. Please stand to be recognized. Thank you. 
Theodore is being appointed to the position of Equal Employment Opportunity Officer in the Office of Equal Employment Opportunity. His BCPS experiences include Human Resources Specialist, Office of Investigations, and Records Management. Congratulations. Our second and final appointment for this evening is Shauna K. Gordon. Shauna, please stand. She's attending this evening with her mother, Juliet Salmon. She's being appointed to the position of Supervisor, Office of Position Management and Human Resources Information System. With almost eight years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include Human Resources Analyst and Human Resources Clerk in the Offices of Temporary Services. Congratulations. Thank you and congratulations to both of you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comment to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and the Office of School Safety have recommended the following safety and security protocols. Participants should be seated in the room during meetings. Individuals who need to stand should go out into the hallway to do so. Participants should not approach the table unless called upon to speak and should not approach the da dais. Materials brought to the table are limited to electronic devices, presentation papers, and posters no larger than 11 by 14 inches. Other items should be left in your seats. Documents to be given to the board are to be handed to the staff member who is seated in the front area of the meeting space. Information for other attendees is to be left on the designated table outside in the hall. In the event of an emergency that requires an emergency response, such as a lockout, lockdown, or evacuation, staff from the Office of School Safety will direct participants. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Disparaging or derogatory remarks towards students and staff will not be tolerated. Inappropriate personnel remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. I will now call on our unions. And our first speaker is Mr. Billy Burke from CASE. Good evening, Mr. Burke. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Mrs. Lichter, Vice Chair Mrs. Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for letting me speak on behalf of CASE. I'd like to speak to you tonight about the rights of transgender students and employees. The federal government, the Maryland state government, and the Baltimore County government all recognize transgender people as a protected class. An announcement from the Pentagon stated, the Defense Department proudly recognizes transgender and gender nonconforming people and their continued struggle for equality, security, and dignity. There is no place for violence and discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression. The American Medical Association Journal of Ethics states, transgender rights stem from human rights, i.e. those fundamental rights belonging to every person. Persons with either cisgender, in which assigned and experienced gender are the same, or transgender identities deserve to live and flourish in their communities with freedom to learn, work, love, and play, and build lives connected with others in home, in the workplace, and in public settings without fear for their safety and survival. Research also shows that transgender children are put at higher risk of attempted suicide or mental health challenges when they face bullying, 
rejection or denial of health care. In previous board meetings, there have been uninformed conversations about bathrooms and locker rooms. I suspect those arguments happen because the topic is easily distorted to become salacious by using outrageous examples that aren't real and are designed to cause fear. The solution to those questions have some simple and commonplace answers. Most public businesses have gender neutral bathroom options. BCPS schools and offices can easily do the same. If the idea of transgender students and staffs makes you uncomfortable, I encourage you to do some research and reading. No one is asking you to give up your beliefs and rights. What you are being asked to do is support the rights of others as a public official and leader. I say all of this because I need you to know that your conversations and decisions in these board meetings matter. Your public comments can inspire the community to show compassion and understanding, or they can inspire the community to continue the legacy of hate and discrimination. Your comments can inspire a child that feels alone and unsupported, or your comments can reinforce their fear and isolation. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Next are the nonprofit community groups, and our first speaker is Arya Kazmina from the Team Meta Metal Pipe Organization. Good evening. Good evening to the chair, vice chair, superintendent, and members of the board. My name is Arya Kazemnia, and I am a senior and a member of the local robotics team focused on providing better STEM education to the greater Baltimore community. You've heard my or you will hear my teammates speak today, and I'll add a new approach to enhancing STEM education. In previous meetings, various members of the board have debated the productivity of half days in the BCPS calendar. Half days have been seen as a waste of student and teacher time, and traditionally half days have not been utilized to teach new lessons, but just as review sessions. I have had many half days in my, high, uh, in my uh, schooling career, and most of them have consisted of review sessions of lessons that have already occurred, which have not been very useful to me or the teacher. In trying to remove half days, however, the calendar does not fulfill the needed teacher and student hours. In the past, my science teachers have used half days to explore topics outside the curriculum through short one-off lessons. And for the most part, those lessons tended to be the most memorable because they were on the topics we were the most interested in. Because of this, I propose we utilize half days as all school or all county STEM days, where students participate in STEM challenges and engage in exploratory learning instead of going to shortened classes. These lessons could be related to what students are learning in their different classes to bring interdisciplinary practices to our county. An example of a half day STEM exploration might look like a fourth grade class who is learning about buoyancy, exploring the topic through various boat related STEM challenges. These challenges could include building boats out of different materials, testing the buoyancies, and <clears throat> applying calculations to forces exerted on boats that keep them afloat. These lessons would build on what the class was learning on regular days in a productive and engaging way in an even shortened class period. Additionally, the half-day STEM exploration could allow students to be exposed within STEM in all their classes and obtain an interest in STEM, and allow them to enter the workforce in a high-paying field, regardless of their socioeconomic background. I believe STEM is the great equalizer. Anyone can succeed in the STEM field, and it brings uh, regardless of their background. And interdisciplinary STEM uh, practices are key to building a more equitable curriculum for our county and leveling the socioeconomic playing field for students. The time is now to equalize the playing field and utilize our half days efficiently to enrich the education of our county. In utilizing half days more effectively, we will be able to add 20 more productive hours to students' years and create experiences that students will never forget. I encourage students to go into high paying fields. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aman Garj. Okay. Our next speaker is Zaneda Rowe. Good evening. 
Good evening to the Chair, Vice Chair, Superintendent, and members of the Board. My name is Zenaida Rowe, and I represent the FTC Team 23741. At previous meetings, we have spoken about interdisciplinary STEM and the importance of STEM magnet programs. Today, however, I will speak on literacy and its connections to STEM. At Cromwell Valley Elementary School, my friends and I were always looking working on a new coding project. Working out a bug in our code was the best part of our day. Exploring the programs and discovering new things we could get our robots to do was exhilarating for young children such as ourselves. Poring over the instructions, writing our own notes and ideas down, all made the process easier and more collaborative. Not only did we have to be skilled in coding or building, we had to be skilled in reading and writing too. We would be amiss to leave out one key factor that impacts STEM education, literacy. In this country, STEM education can only be improved so far if the current situation with the literacy of our students remains. At the county level, across 115 elementary schools, only 39% of our students are at the proficient level of reading. This does not get better as our students advance with only 30% of middle schoolers and 40% of high schoolers proficient in reading. How can we expect our students to be prepared for the future when a majority of them cannot read at the required level? How can we advance our STEM education when our students are so shockingly unsupported? This issue needs to be addressed and quickly. We cannot keep failing our students and expect to be a system that will advance into the future. Knowledge is found in what you read. You deprive our children of knowledge when you fail to teach them how to absorb it. STEM is the future and literacy is the bridge to better STEM education. Two board meetings ago, the county's statewide test scores seemed to indicate that our students cannot read proficiently. The presenter stated that the type one math problems based solely on algebraic computations went very well for students. However, in the type two and three math problems, students were not able to understand the questions and therefore could not determine the correct formulas to solve world pro word problems. This indicates that our students have a strong basis in math, however, they lack the vocabulary to understand the problems. Logarith logarithmic relationships, exponential relationships, linear relationships, quadratic relationships. All of these words can be used to represent graphs and functions in math problems. However, just seeing them once or learning them, what they mean is not enough to solidify them in students' minds. When experiments are done with these graphs, students from form mental connections, which helps them better remember the meaning of these graphs. For example, a common logarithmic relationship is the equation to determine the brightness of a star. A common exponential relationship is compounding interest. By giving students the mental connections between scientific or mathematical words and, experiment, and experiments done in class, students can better understand problems they are asked to solve. Literacy is required for comprehension. To understand these connections, our students must be able to read on grade level. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tara Thompson from Moms for Liberty, Baltimore County. Hello, how is everybody? Good evening. Sorry I'm a little late, thanks for having me. So I had a whole speech tonight and I was driving here and I decided to ditch it. And I'm just gonna talk from the heart, tell you who I am. I am the chapter chair of Moms for Liberty here in Baltimore County. I'm a mom of three boys. And I want to tell you my why and the reason I'm here. This school system failed my three boys seven years ago. It started. They were taught whole language. They were not taught to read. And I am still here today fighting for them. I'm not fighting just for my kids. I'm fighting for all kids. And my main focus is not books. It's not curriculum. It's children. And I hate to have to bring the topic up of our sexually explicit books that are in our schools, but if we are not focusing on what's important here, structured literacy, and doing it right, and teaching our children to read and write, and getting the extra out, how are we going to how are we going to have our children learn to read? How are we going to produce children that are happy and healthy and making Maryland a great place for us as adults. I mean, our children are going to be taking care of us one day when we're in the hospital, when we're at the grocery store. We are the adults here, and it is our responsibility to do them justice. Seven years ago, this school system did not do my boys justice, and I am here today because of that. I am here to address 
several of these books that I know many of you have read. Genderqueer, Lawn Boy, Let's Talk About It. I am not a mom who is trying to make a stink about these books. I have so many other things to do on my plate. I have too much to do. I have three boys. I question myself daily, why am I here? <laughs> what am I doing? I'm being a mom, and I'm fighting for my children and all of the children in Baltimore County Public Schools because I don't want to see one more child be failed by this school system. It's ugly. And there's lots of children that are being failed. So if we can't get this right and we can't sit down and read a book, there's plenty of opportunities to read a book in about a week. Audiobooks are amazing. My children love them as dyslexics. We are at a point now in time where it should not take 10 or 11 months to review a book by a committee to give an answer back that says, our parents can opt our children out of a book. No, this should be an opt-in. These books should be hidden off the shelf and an opt-in. And honestly, I don't even think they have a place on the shelf. And I hope that many of you can agree with that when you read these books. Please consider this when you have your next meeting and you're reviewing. Thank you. Next are individual citizens and student groups. And our first speaker is Sharon Serhoff. Good evening, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, I apologize for not being able to be there in person, um, but I am dealing with a family emergency and I do appreciate the fact that you are accommodating me virtually. I'm here today because I have been seeing a lot of disturbing uh, things going on in the school system with special education. Um, through the meetings that I'm having for my clients. Um, first it, and most important is identification of a student with a disability or identification um, as to whether or not a child is still eligible for having a disability. We do assessments every three years or we do an assessment um, initially to find out what the concerns are. And one of the things that I'm seeing is schools telling a parent that we have to wait until the child is developmentally at the right point for us to test them. Well, the purpose of special education is not to wait until a child is developmentally where they need to be because kids develop in different ages, different paces. So I shouldn't be hearing at a meeting, well, I'm not going to test your child who is eight years old and having difficulty reading because developmentally, they're not there yet. If it's an eight-year-old, they most certainly are having difficulty. You should evaluate what that difficulty is and then address it. Um, one of the tasks that's not being done, especially if a child has a lot of other concerns going on, is auditory processing. And the excuses that I'm getting from these evaluators is, well, we can't test everybody, so we're not gonna test this child or this child has so many things going on, we can't tease it out. From the standpoint of a person who has a difficulty with auditory processing, that is a very important item to help a child communicate appropriately and to avoid behaviors. I think BCPS needs to reevaluate how they decide whether or not a child is able to get evaluated so that we can address the problems more appropriately instead of denying them evaluations that could pick out a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Abraham Kara Kenneth. Our next speaker is Bosch Farone.
evening to all. Good evening. I owe you an apology. Last time I accused the board of uh, conducting short meetings, abdicating your duties, and I sincerely, sincerely apologize. I know you work hard. I know I cannot do your job. That's why I'm in this chair. It's easy to criticize. But really, the past three weeks have been stressful for me and hard work on top of coming here. So because your meetings are really managed well, I really applaud you, Madam Chair. If you make the meetings shorter, I will praise you even more. Well, tonight for, you might want to praise me then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll praise you for each one okay. hour done. All right, so. Go. got it. All right. So apologies-wise, I don't think any public speaker <coughs> has ever apologized to you in my past 20, 25 years of being in this chair. So this is the first for me. And because Burke, Mr. Burke talked about equality, I agree. I think the system also needs to apologize to a public speaker if something wrong is done. So in relation to my email, it's really water under the bridge. It's done. I want to contribute as much as I could in this capacity to the school system. So I served in the policies, and I came to policy 1260. Last time it has been reviewed, 2019. And I noticed that the policy is about volunteering, which I am volunteer. But it's so brief. It's even more brief than a cable in 1917. It's really brief. And I recommend that Madam Chair for the PRC to review it. The reason I say it's important because there are many old people, young people like me, who can be volunteers in the school system. I offered my uh, volunteerism to a couple of board members in the past and they never really picked on it, which is fine. But people like us could work for you as board members to research for you to help you answer an email, it's really important that you answer people like myself. Even if you make a smiley face, even if you type in the word acknowledged, it is really important. I pay $12,000 of property tax every year, half of it to the school system, add to that federal, state, and county. I deserve an email. Thank you. Since there are speaker spaces available, we will go to the wait list and um, Eric Morris is our next speaker. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Eric Morris. Um, I'm a proud BCPS employee, but today I'm here as a proud parent of three teenagers in BCPS, um, two of which who are transgender. Um, I would like to praise the staff of the high school where my children go for the unwavering support of their LGBTQ plus population, um, especially their school counselors. However, I'll not state the school name or staff members specifically because I don't want the local hate groups that have been out here recently talking to um, target them. Prior to and during the board meeting on October 10th, it was pretty exciting around here. Um, we had one of those hate groups making statements that our transgender students are creating unsafe environments for children. When in fact they were the ones that were perpetrating the fear um, and they were creating the unsafe environment for those children. I see it every day in my job, LGBTQ students who are afraid to be themselves in school. Um, because of the fear and retribution from others. As the new Foo Fighter song rescued states, kings and queens and in-betweens, we all deserve the rights. So I am here to implore you, the board, the elected officials, the leaders of BCPS, 
to reread the BCPS LGBTQ plus guidelines and call for a vote to make those guidelines district policies. Or better yet, put together a special committee to plan a new inclusive policy, a committee made of teachers and staff, administration and parents, and students and outside LGBTQ plus expert organizations to put together the best policies to protect our LGBTQ plus children like mine. Thank you for your time and efforts for students, for all students. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session and for that I call on Ms. Devasti Jones. Madam Chair, since there were no action items taken during the closed session, there's nothing to report. Okay, thank you. The next item on the agenda is new business revised organization chart 2023-2024 and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board. I bring forward to you a revised org chart. It is a, the one change on the chart is under the office of the Chief of Staff, Executive Director, per the change approved by the board on October 20th, uh, excuse me, October 10th, 2023. May I have a motion to approve the revised 2023-2024 organization chart? So moved, Pumphrey. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Stolowski. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Okay, that passes. So congratulations to our Executive Director of Communications sitting in the corner. <laughs> Okay, that one took a while to get here, didn't it? <laughs> All right, then somebody's passing me a note. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the report on highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff and school climate. Blueprint pillar two, high quality, diverse teachers and leaders. And as Mr. McCall comes to the table, um, Dr. Rogers will begin the presentation. Thank you again. Mr. McCall will be joined by several members of the team. Mr. McCall, Chief Human Resources Officer, Michelle Feeney, Executive Director for Human Resources, Jordan Birnbaum, Manager, Employee Training and Development, Carla Simons, Manager for Certification, and Jill Snell, Coordinator, Teacher Leadership. I want to thank everyone this evening for the presentation of pillar number two of the blueprint. This pillar is really focused on highly qualified and diverse teachers and leaders in direct alignment with our system priority for, to have highly effective staff. As we have shared before, academic achievement, next slide please. As we have shared before, academic achievement is our number one priority. We know in order to move our students forward academically in all areas, it's going to take highly qualified teachers and principals to do this work. In terms of making sure that we have highly effective staff, our goal is to recruit, retain, and to train our teachers at high levels. The blueprint allows us to move forward with these goals. Under pillar number two, there are specific goals to recruit and maintain high quality diverse teachers, to increase the rigor of teacher preparation, to implement comprehensive in-service educator training, establish a career ladder and professional development system, as well as improve educator compensation. As we move forward, with establishing a strong professional learning culture in Baltimore County Public School. This team will walk us through each section of Pillar 2, sharing not only what the expectations are from the state level, but what we have done so far in Baltimore County Public Schools and what our next steps are. 
So I'll turn it over to Mr. McCall. Thank you, Dr. Rogers and members of the board. Uh, as Dr. Rogers mentioned, uh, we will be presenting tonight on the uh, blueprint for Maryland's future. There are five distinct pillars. And for tonight, of course, we'll be focused on pillar two. And pillar two is the high quality and diverse teachers and leaders. Specifically in tonight's presentation, what we'll be sharing with you is those initiatives that we have done as a system, those that are in progress, and then what are our next steps in terms of looking forward to putting in this implementation, putting the blueprint into full implementation. So on the next slide, please. As you can see here, we have a number of folks from Team BCPS here in front of you, representing cross-divisional work that we'll be working uh, to implement the Pillar 2. Uh, in addition to that, we have institutions of higher education, uh, the MSDE, as well as other members of BCPS, our external stakeholders, and then also communities. This is a lengthy process and, of course, uh, involves not only just uh, members from Team BCPS, but also external stakeholders as well. And that's the reason why I have the bar across the bottom that talks about uh, st stakeholder engagement. Okay. Next slide, please. Specifically, when we look at recruitment and hiring, 2.1, recruitment and maintaining a high quality and diverse teacher workforce, some of the things that we have currently done and then those things uh, we're looking at for those next steps. We have been working with our colleges and universities on particular job fairs. In addition to that, working with our own BCPS job fairs here within the system and also our diversity events. We have also implemented and also um, revised our historically black colleges and universities uh, recruitment plan. In addition to that, we continue our efforts in Puerto Rico. Um, not only do we advertise here on our website, we also advertise in various um, uh, vendors outside of the system when it comes to uh, literature on the web, as well as information that we share with our institutions that we build partnerships with. The institutions of higher education themselves, uh, instead of just going to our job fairs, uh, a lot of times, you, as you know, our uh, the numbers of teachers who are going through teacher education programs have decreased, have been on the decline for several years. So in order to, uh, to invite others in, we've expanded those recruitment efforts into visiting classrooms outside of teacher education programs. For instance, those who are math majors, maybe math, uh, excuse me, science majors, we're looking at recruiting those individuals, those who may not have thought about going into education. So my, my mother was a classroom teacher, did everything to, to, to avoid going into the classroom myself. But nonetheless, here I am today. Um, so those individuals may not have thought about going into education, but it's just planting those seeds in those individuals who are currently out there, who have the content knowledge. It's just a matter of getting them the pedagogy uh, as well. Uh, other things we have done uh, is interns as long-term substitute as a pilot here in the system, working with institutions such as uh, Morgan State University, uh, UMBC, and also Towson University. The other thing that we have also implemented is our Teacher Academy of Maryland, those interns who are working with the students who are working as interns in the classrooms. And then another thing we find to be beneficial and fruitful this year, particularly, was implementing the signing and relocation bonuses. That was one thing that we have found that was uh, beneficial for those who are moving 75 miles or greater from Baltimore County. Uh, in addition to that, working with our Equity Advisory Council to support and retain our minoritized uh, teachers. Some of those things that, we've, that I've just mentioned as HR initiatives, we are still looking to expand that with our next steps. Actually, formalizing our interns as long-term substitutes. Of course, we started with a smaller group this year as a pilot, but we're looking to expand that as well. Identify and select teacher uh, apprentices. Uh, career changers, as I mentioned to you before, going into classrooms, but then you have individuals who've been in, the, uh, in their respective uh, business fields to recruit them into education as well. Uh, expand our, our uh, higher education classroom visits beyond the education classrooms. One thing we found beneficial, but also continue to expand upon that. And as I mentioned before, uh, exploring the continuation of our signing and our relocation bonuses. So next slide, please. 
So at this time, what I'd like to do is turn it over to my colleague, uh, Ms. Michelle Feeney, to take us into the data. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Good evening, everyone. To provide the board with context around the current demographics and our efforts for recruiting and supporting high quality, diverse teachers and staff, the following two graphs and the following two slides show the numbers and percentages of school-based administrators as well as teachers and support staff hired for FY 22-23 and FY 23-24. It is important to note that the FY 23-24 data is not yet complete as we are still in quarter one of the school year. The blue charts at the bottom of the slide illustrate both internal and external hires. Internal hires for school-based administrators reflect internal transfers and promotions within the system. External numbers show hires from outside BCPS from last year and this year. The pie charts show that FY 2023, 66% of the BCPS administrators hired were white, 33% black, 1% Hispanic. In FY 2324, so far, so far, there are 65% white hires, 1% less than last year, 31% black hires, 2% less than last year, 2% Asian, 2% more than last year, and 1% Hispanic, which is the same as last year. Next slide. This next slide provides the teacher and support staff hiring data. During FY22-23, BCPS hired 1,031 classroom teachers and 163 support staff. The demographic data show that 55% of the hires were white, 35% were black, 5% were Hispanic, and 2% of the teachers and support staff were Asian. So far this school year, we have hired 756 classroom teachers and 105 support staff. The demographics of the staff are 56% white, 33% black, 4% Hispanic, 4% Asian, and 2% two or more races. Considering that we are still in quarter one of the school year, the data between the two years is comparable, and this year we will have the opportunity to increase our diversity numbers in our recruitment efforts and also focus on retention of the staff we already have hired for BCPS. In the following slides, Carla Simon will speak to retention in regards to our Pillar 2 goals. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thanks. Okay, good. Um, another objective of Pillar 2 it requires increasing the rigor of teacher preparation programs and licensure requirements. Uh, this objective includes LEAs and institutions of higher education partnering. Uh, there's a specific emphasis on teacher mentorship as well as grow our own teachers. Uh, re revision of the existing Maryland regulation is currently in progress with MSDE, uh, but in the initial blueprint implementation plan, LEAs were asked to provide uh, what work is currently in place to support teacher mentors, excuse me, teacher interns, conditional teachers, and growing our own paraeducators. Uh, in the plan, we identified a variety of initiatives uh, to offer future BCPS teachers halfway to the classroom, uh, some of which are funded by the Maryland's LEADS grant. Uh, as we move forward with implementing the blueprint, uh, we are working to identify, braiding, identify braiding, braiding funding uh, to support programs to uh, allow teachers to earn certification, as well as diversify our teacher candidate pool. Next slide, please. Um, now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jordan Beerbaum, to talk to you about National Board Certification. Good evening, everyone. In 2.4, the goal is to establish a new educator career ladder and professional development, and we are looking specifically at National Board Certification. And so our objective is to create a support program that supports candidates who are pursuing and participating in National Board Certification. In addition to that, another objecti objective that we have is to recruit and encourage experienced teachers to participate in the national board process. Currently, we have ongoing con content support sessions for our existing NBC candidates. That happens at least once a month. 
uh, oftentimes bi-monthly or bi-weekly. Um, so we're providing ongoing support sessions for them to help them through the content and the process. We also host candidate workshops, which are guided by our professional learning facilitators, who are national board certified teachers who have been, who are experienced in the process, um, and have also been trained on coaching and supporting candidates as well. We continue to have ongoing informational sessions to increase uh, timeline awareness, as well as helping candidates through the logistics of the national board process. So in addition to getting a firm understanding of what's to be expected in terms of content, we also provide that understanding in terms of timeline and um, responsibilities that our candidates have as well. We provide coaching support for candidates at every level, whether they are an initial candidate, they're retaking a component, or they're maintaining their cert certification. We provide that support for them throughout that entirety of their process and beyond as well to make sure that they're up to date with um, when they need to recertify. We've also developed school-based cohorts throughout the district so that our candidates can have a support system uh, locally. So beyond what we've done as a district, we provide a little bit more intimate setting where they can feel comfortable collaborating with colleagues and then getting um, some more personalized support from their professional learning facilitators as well. We continue to uh, recruit and train new professional learning facilitators so that we can expand our support for our existing candidates continue to uh, conduct school outreach and collaboration with our schools to increase candidate support so that everyone's aware of the process and how to best support the candidates in their building. And we continue to collaborate with counties throughout Maryland so that we can engage not only in problems of practice, but also identify best practices for supporting candidates throughout the district. As we look forward to next steps, we want to continue to increase our enrollment of eligible employees into the NBC program, as well as increase enrollment in our low performing schools. And so we'll continue to target those schools and continue to market the benefits of becoming national board certified, which include um, the achievement of our students. We want to increase the diversity of candidates that are engaged in the national board process so that it's more representative of the student demographic data and then expand our support program through increased in our increased enrollment of professional learning facilitators. And lastly, we want to expand our support and preparation for our existing and potential candidates, not through just what we do throughout the year, but also providing additional support throughout the summer as well so that they can be better prepared to hit the ground running as the new school year begins. Next slide, please. We wanted to share some of the data that we have so far in our national board certified teachers. And so when we look at school year 21-22, we had 67 teachers that were national board certified. As we look to the school year 22-23, which was the first year of the fee incentive program, we had 74 teachers that were national board certified. And that number remains uh, very close to that now as we look at uh, the year 23-24 as uh, we are now at 73. An important note for this particular school year is that the assessment results are released in December, which means that we may have an additional 49 candidates that would be national board certified. And if we even look even further ahead, that number combined with um, what we could potentially have for this year could actually double heading into school year 24-25. So the number of national board certified teachers is growing exponentially. When we compare our data to national numbers and Maryland numbers, we can see that the national average is 4% of the teacher population. And in Maryland is a little bit higher at 5.6%. And so BCPS is a little bit below that mark. But with the initiatives that we have, um, our continued outreach, our ability to support our candidates, um, we, we expect fully that that number would continue to grow. And now over to Jill Snell, who will talk about the career ladder implementation. Thanks, Jordan. Um, I get really excited um, when I get to talk about the career ladder. Um, it is a major component of pillar two of the blueprint. Um, national board certification and the career ladder really work hand in hand, and you're going to see that on a slide, the next slide that Carla is going to go over. You'll see exactly what that looks like. Um, 
why I get really excited about um, the career ladder is really, um, it's all about the spirit of the career ladder and it's keeping our most effective teachers in the classroom while also giving them an opportunity to lead and earn additional compensation. Um, and so really looking forward to what's to come. Um, we have a long way to go yet. We know full implementation for the blueprint isn't until 2032. Um, so we have some years to be working on it, but um, we are excited to share some of the steps that we have taken so far in the last two and a half years that we've been working on um, the career ladder. So, so far, BCPS has an established career ladder work group, and the work group has also an established an, a, de a development board. So if you think of um, the development board as kind of the big body where we go to a lot of different stakeholders within BCPS um, to get feedback on the different work that we're doing, and then the work group gets to the work and then brings it back to the development board for more feedback. So that's kind of how those two bodies are working together towards um, career ladder implementation. Um, most recently, we um, have communicated with a TABCO board member, and we have plans to present at an upcoming RA and then um, work through the TABCO representatives to get communication out to the schools so that teachers know what's coming with um, the career ladder. And then um, the fun part, we get to start reimagining teacher leadership roles here in BCPS. So, Carly, you want to show them the image? Thank you. <laughs> so next slide, please. So pictured here is the established BCPS career ladder structure uh, as required by the law. Um, the levels represent an educator's ability to advance. Um, so level one includes professionally certified teachers. This does not include additional salary. Uh, level two uh, includes those national board candidates uh, who have establish their commitment to achieve certification. Uh, this also does not come with additional salary. Um, now you get to level three, um, where a teacher earns national board certification. They are eligible for $10,000 additional uh, on top of their base salary. And if they are assigned to a low performing school, they can receive an additional 7,000. So that's potentially 17 for a national board teacher who's assigned to a low performing school. Um, there are requirements though. Th these teachers must be assigned to teach in the classroom. There's a 60% work time required, teaching time, excuse me, and 50% work time for any teacher leaders. Once um, they hit the level four rung, they're, sorry, they're different rungs. You have uh, the profess, the lead teacher, excuse me, the distinguished teacher, and the professor distinguished teacher. Um, all of these rungs also come with additional salary. Um, additional salary is also available if an uh, educator maintains their national board certificate. So there's opportunity for an educator to keep building on their salary earning potential. Um, the AIB has reported to us that like many school systems, we um, are, we established a basic structure as per the law, but we still, as Jill said, we still have to reimagine what teacher leadership looks like on this career ladder. Yeah. You can go ahead to the next slide. All right, so how are we going to stay on track with this monumental change that's going to happen over the next nine or so years? Um, fortunately, the AIB supports us in that through our yearly implementation plan. So you can see the whole implementation plan um, on our BCPS Blueprint website. Um, this is our essential activities specifically around Pillar 2 and the career ladder. So you can see where we started um, really focusing on national board certification in 2021-22 and then you can see our actions that we took 
um, last year and then the work that is um, charged to us this year. You can see that there's some overlap of things that were started um, last year and are continuing, um, like I said, into this um, particular school year. Um, if there, like I said, I know that this is super, super small, but really um, what I wanted to show you here was just that uh, there is a plan and there is, um, there is uh, um, support from the AIB. Most recently, we also were assigned um, support from the AIB, so we're looking forward to some personalized and customized care um, from the representative from the AIB. And next slide. So the minimum teacher salary for BCPS this current fiscal year, FY 2024, is 58500 It's one of the highest in the state. Um, the organization will negotiate in the coming years to ensure fair competitive pay within the fiscal constraints we are under. Um, BCPS will exceed the 60,000 60, minimum teacher starting salary as required by the blueprint uh, by July 1st, 2026. So, next slide, please. At this time, we want to thank you for your time and attention. And at this time, we'd like to take any questions. Questions from board members? Ms. Frampong? Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I had a couple of questions or just a general question around the retention. Um, Mr. McCall, thank you for mentioning the Equity Advisory Council. Yes. There was a lot of um, comments about um, teacher support that came out of that. So I guess I was just interested in hearing a little bit more about support um, for the, from the perspective of maybe teachers who are not pursuing that NBC. I saw in the presentation about NBC, but for example, you know, just a, a newer teacher being in a school where there may be more um, behavior issues or, um, the, again, the lower performing academics, what type of supports can be um, found for that teacher? Thank you for that question. I will um, start us off. Uh, simply because a lot of the work for the additional teacher support is outside of human resources. Human resources gets them in for us if there's national board certification. They work on that, but we really work with our, our principals as well as organizational effectiveness to provide new teacher support. So we have peer advisors at our schools. Um, and, and that is a role where we try to match um, every new teacher to an advisor within the school. Uh, New teachers typically will receive a consulting teacher. Uh, consulting teacher, those are our experts uh, that provide um, individualized support to the teacher. They provide uh, observation feedback, uh, informal and formal observations, and part of the evaluation process for the first two years, um, in addition to the leadership at the school. Um, some schools have staff development teachers. Uh, and that's an additional layer of support to provide uh, help and support to our new teachers um, outside of our new educator orientation experience that kicks off in August. However, part of our work uh, moving forward, uh, both as our school system priority to make sure that we have highly effective staff and in alignment with the blueprint is to move to a more comprehensive um, new educator um, support uh, pathway. So over the last year and a half, we've brought all kinds of divisions and offices together to make sure that we're collaborating on what that support looks like for new teachers so that we're not overwhelming them. Uh, but there's still a need to provide uh, additional support, particularly in schools where you have um, larger numbers of new teachers and where you have uh, new teachers that don't come directly from uh, educational background, which need different, who need uh, different differentiated support. So that's part of our work moving forward. You're welcome. Other questions, Mr. Young? So on the slide, um, BCPS hiring data, we, you have it titled teachers. Um, inside of there, it's school-based teachers. You have classroom and support. Yes. So who's considered support? Oh, so, so the support <laughs> staff would include paraeducators, um, 
in um, people who are resource resources for the school. Okay, and with them being defined as paraeducators, and later on in the slide you talk about um, with by July of 2026, you know, the minimum salary being 60000 You In an earlier slide, you talk about retention and the current HR initiatives around paraeducators. So are they also factored into this wholesale approach of, okay, yes, within budget constraints that we need to look at retaining them, their salary structure also? So I, I think we we can talk to the paraeducator piece. First of all, as a former principal, one of the things that um, we tried to do was make sure that we took our paraeducators who were um, ready to be to be teachers and gave them opportunities to learn how to do that within the school building. But this kind of formalizes the process for them so that they have a clear pathway to becoming a teacher. Some of them have difficulty maybe affording the classes or what have you, so this would give an opportunity for them to be able to um, work in the school, learn, still learn in the schoolhouse, but also um, be able to take the classes that would help them earn a teaching degree. Mr. Young, if I could also respond to your question in terms of a pathway and compensation for our paraeducators. Um, they are part of ESPBC, and ESPBC definitely negotiates on their behalf, especially with our Grow Your Own program, to, to make sure that we're able to move them forward uh, within the system as opposed to any teacher, any paraeducator having to take a break in order to become a full-time teacher in Baltimore County. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, good evening. Thank you for the presentation. It's been very informative. I really appreciate it. Um, my question has to do with our growing Hispanic student population. Um, the last number I saw was 14% of our students are Hispanic Latino. Um, I'm, my question is, what specific steps are we taking to recruit teachers, um, Hispanic teachers, and are there particular challenges that we need to address to increase that population? Thank you. So part of that uh, answer was in the presentation where we talked about the uh, recruitment in Puerto Rico as well as part of that. Uh, we also do make an effort as well when it comes to going to our colleges, universities, and re recruiting teachers outside of education, but then also those who are potentially education majors. But we have uh, looked at expanding that as and knowing that uh, we do have a growing population and our teacher demographics certainly, as you saw earlier, does not reflect that. So we are certainly uh, doing everything we can to increase uh, those teachers in our various demographic groups to uh, reflect that of our student population. But part of that, of course, as I mentioned before, is definitely expanding our Puerto Rico recruitment uh, there. Um, but, um, but of course, that, yeah. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Mm -hmm. um, are there any community partnerships that we've looked into in terms of building those relationships and reaching out to that absolutely that yes, community yes, yes, yes ma'am okay mm -hmm. thank you thank you and Ms. Hen, I would add um, with Mr. McCall, absolutely with the community partnerships, and I would also say that another layer that we're working on this year will be working directly with our embassies. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Other questions, Ms. Booker Dwyer? So thank you for the presentation. I think this is a, it's a great start to, to getting more teachers and, and educators in Baltimore County. Um, so I'm wondering if we could take it up a notch. So, and what I mean by that is, you know, the traditional recruitment strategies of going to colleges and universities is just not working. It's not, we're not yielding the results that that's anticipated. And so I'm thinking of, is there a more innovative approach that we could take? For instance, how are we leveraging social media? Like when I'm scrolling through Instagram reels, I'm fully expecting to see something from Baltimore County Public Schools, not explicitly saying come teach with us, but you're using that marketing, that communication strategy to make to make me want to come here. Or even looking at um, incent incentivizing. So I, I you know, I think going to Puerto Rico, it's great. Yes. But we can go to Texas. We can pull people from, from those border states and offer and incentivize them and their spouses. If we offer, okay, if you come and teach with us, 
um, your spouse can get first in line interview consideration for a position within our school system. Not saying we have to hire them, but we can at least um, offer them an interview. And so things like that where I, that I see other states, well, other school systems starting to do, they're even looking at teacher adjacent roles. And so a teacher adjacent role, recruiting from that, that would be like, you know, when you go to the zoo and the person with the bird on their arm or the person in, at the National Aquarium standing out in front of the exhibit, these are people who have skill sets that could lend themselves to teaching with a little more coaching, a little more prep, could, um, could they could be successful teachers. And so what I'm seeing nationally is that the college recruitment just isn't working. And so partnering with a nonprofit as well. So I think about the Maryland Business Roundtable. They have tons of volunteers that go into schools. So that's the pool to recruit from for the career changers. And so just taking it up a notch. I mean, like I'm fully expecting when I go to see Beyonce's Renaissance in the movie theater, that before um, the, the show starts, I'm seeing something for Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, I'm just, if you have the budget. Um. <laughs> okay. Ms. Booker Dwyer, while you will not see it on the Beyonce tour. However, if you're in the MVA, you will see us. If you are at the beach, you will see yes. us. We so. definitely have tried to take it up a notch and be creative in terms of the different approaches that we're taking. Um, you bring up some good points in terms of additional partners and some of those border states um, that perhaps, you know, we, we can look at, you know, how do we get out there? Uh, we do some of this virtual, but I think what we have seen over the last few years are people really appreciate the face-to-face -face opportunities that exist. And so um, we heard from our principals that the opportunity to bring everyone together for all the different roles was a missed piece that they wanted us to bring back last year. And so we we did that uh, last year for the first time in a long time since the pandemic. Uh, but but I think, you know, there's opportunities to do more. Uh, we probably can't afford those price tags, but there are some other uh, more, you know, fiscally, you know, sound places that we can go to. So stay tuned and we hear and receive that message to, um, you know, think about different ways uh, to bring people on. Uh, to be members of Team BCPS. And hopefully when you are scrolling on social media, you see uh, many, not only those advertisements directly looking for school side as well as operations, but you also see um, just snippets about, you know, what life in BCPS looks like. What is the experience with students? What is the experience with our stakeholders and partners? And so more of that to come. Yep, Thank you. I would love that. And then I just have one more thing. When you talk about retention, Baltimore County, I mean, I think you all are doing a great job with principal development and really working to build that leadership pipeline. And a key piece to retaining teachers is the school leader. And so when I look at your slide eight, where you're talking about retention, I would even talk about the work that you're doing with principals to ensure that, because we, you can pay a teacher all you want if the school leader isn't great, then it's, you're not going to retain them. And so, the, I, you know, I just don't want you all to shortchange yourselves in the work that you're doing with um, school leaders right now. I mean, I know that's not specifically HR, but if there could be a tie to that to really emphasize that it's about the whole school um, system, because you all are doing some great, great things, and I just don't want it to be shortchanged. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Yeah, I just have two questions. The national certified teachers, how often do they have to reapply to maintain that status? So currently every five years they have to recertify and maintain their certification. Okay. And on a completely different topic, the, the idea of career changers. You know, there's a lot of people out there that aren't happy with what they're doing. And if somehow we could tap into that and just, if, if nothing more than, you know, sharing ideas with them, somehow to, if, if they're thinking this, you know, they're looking at something else. They're, you know, what else can I do to, to have a more rewarding, you know, career experience? If somehow we could tap into them. Absolutely. Uh, and part of that is, is we're doing that currently. Um, because if we rely totally on those individuals that were coming out of our teacher air programs, we'll have classrooms that are, are empty, a lot, of, a lot more vacancies than we have, and that's nationally. But certainly if there's an individual who's out there who hadn't thought about education, we are leveraging that support to try to get them into, uh, into the classroom. Uh, talking about those promotional opportunities for the, with them as well, because a lot of times 
They may have families, and they may be looking for, well, if I'm in the classroom, can I see that, see myself in a path, trajectory to become an administrator? And so when we're going out to recruit, we're taking individuals who may not have been education majors with us, uh, those who are alumni of those institutions, or individuals who, like I say, are career changers, or coming out of um, non-traditional education majors who are math majors explaining to them the benefits that, of being a teacher with Team BCPS. And so at least having that, uh, that sort of um, uh, support with us uh, gives them an opportunity to see themselves through that individual as well. So absolutely, career changes as well. Thank, yes. thank you. Thank Ms. Daleski. Um, thank you. This vision really seems to be a great long-term plan for um, retention. My question just relates to um, the number of teachers in Baltimore County that their career path takes them to administration. <coughs> so if you can compare the, the benefits, whether financial, salary, versus other benefits or perks from um, becoming, for example, an assistant principal or a lead teacher versus your level four options of um, the distinguished teacher and the professor distinguished teacher, just to understand how the perks of staying in the classroom could possibly outweigh going mm -hmm. uh, um, down a different path within BCPS, whether administration or central office or something else. Thank you. Board Member Stileski, I'll, I'll try to take that one. The, the team is giving each other the looks because we don't have the uh, numbers quite established. Uh, but, I, but I think the goal and the spirit of the blueprint is to have uh, a higher percentage of teachers choose to stay in the classroom. Um, that, uh, you know, you have that balance between people who move forward with administration because there are some, uh, while there's a lot of work, I can attest to, and administration, there's a lot of work in the classroom teacher as well. But what we're really trying to do with that career ladder implementation is make sure that in terms of compensation, there's increased higher compensation all the way through. And so the full implementation, um, the expectation is another eight years from now, but you know we'll we'll be there earlier than that. Uh, but but the goal would be that you know it's comparable to um, at least the beginning administrator salary. Um, we know that the long-term teachers who stay in for um, you know a few decades, some of them, uh, you know they their compensation is higher uh, than an entry-level administration, and so that would be the goal as we uh, move forward. In addition to you know the work is just different where you're trying to move a whole school or a department or a grade level forward, um, as opposed to you know the teacher, you're really working on those students that come inside and outside of your classroom every day. But the goal is to make sure that it's competitive, uh, that we're not you know we have a healthy balance of people who want to stay in the classroom for career long as well as those who want to move up into administration but no numbers yet okay that's great <laughs> thank you other questions mr. young when you look at the career ladder slide that you showed you have you know level one level two level three um, board member McMillan his question to you was you know the recertification time frame when we look at um, going from say a candidate level two to a teacher level three, what is the average time frame commitment associated with that? Uh, Jordan, I think it takes about three years, yeah, I, about three years for a candidate to work through the national board process. So a person could potentially sit on level two for three years. Okay. and. With starting at, of course, a level one, do we basically um, recommend that they are a certified teacher for a certain number of years before they start pursuing? So, The law does not require a certain number of years. Um, there is a fee incentive program that does require a certain amount of years, but national board does not require a teacher to complete X number of years before attempting to earn the certification. Okay, and I saw you, part of the initiatives that you had were, um, you know, workshops, but for those teachers pursuing the certification, I guess the fee is all on them? So it's, 
the if they sign up for the fee incentive program, which is a split and pay, so Baltimore County pays one third of their components, while MSDE will pay two thirds. So if they're eligible for the fee incentive program, the only out of pocket cost for them would be the seventy five dollar registration fee for each year that they're completing a component. If they choose to complete certification outside of that fee incentive program, and an example of that would be they don't meet the minimum requirements set out for that program, as in the number of years that they're certified in teaching, then um, they would be responsible for um, all the payments that are required for those components. And with the recertification, um, that's on them, the, the study, the test prep, all of that's their responsibility also? Fortunately, we have support programs for those that are looking to recertify, and you don't have to be in the fee incentive program to receive that support. So anyone pursuing national board certification get, receives that support. And so that would include those that are recertifying. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a couple clarifying questions. So on that same slide where it's level one through level four, is level four mean you have to be a national board certified teacher, or is level Yes. Okay. So that whole slide is just for nationally board certified mm -hmm. teachers. Yes. Okay. Then, um, and that is a low percentage, even nationally. I know we're lower, but even nationally, the number of teachers that go that route is very small, and it's it's very time intensive. So, Ms. Snell, what you are talking about is a different way to look at teacher leaders other than the national board certification. So, um, it's really the most recent work that the most current work that we're going to need to do is reimagining the roles that are stated on that level four of the career ladder. So if you think of it as, you know, an entry level teacher, your certified teacher being level one, level two is I've declared that I want to attain national board certification, but I haven't yet. Level three, I'm now a national board certified teacher. I'm teaching in a classroom. I get the additional salary incentives for national board certification, but I could sit at level three until one of those positions became available that's in level four. Um, and so that's where we really need to think about, you know, like we, you know, we have lots of teacher leadership roles. We have right. staff development teachers and we have CTs and we have department chairs. We have reading specialists, resource teachers. We have to really think about how does all that fit together when we're looking at the law and the law tells us that that level four is those three different levels of teacher leadership. So you have to be nationally board certified. To, so, so there's not like a parallel program right now about how do we grow teacher leaders without going through national board certification. You have to go. You can't. So we have our own internal okay. programs okay. that we've always All had, right? right? So like blueprint those is just national yeah, those board aren't certified. going away, okay? Right. So then, right. So then, following the law, this is the career ladder for educators, and yes, okay. there is heavy emphasis on national board certification. Okay, thank you for that. Yep. And then, just um, to the point about looking at other venues for recruiting, um, I look at the Attendance Matters campaign and how that huge campaign internally has taken off, and you open up you know, um, Twitter or whatever it's called, X now, and you see people really buying into it. So I think it's all of our responsibilities to be recruiting for the system. So even somehow to, to make people understand that this is not just HR's responsibility or just a principal's when they're on a recruiting or at a new teacher, um, you know, hiring piece, but that we all have to be huge advocates for our system and, and try and recruit it. One of my favorite stories this year was going to visit a school, and um, Mr. Muster, for one of the executive directors, was in a classroom with us. I think you were with me, and we were all watching the kids and watching the teacher, and then the next thing I know, Mr. Muster has disappeared. Um, and I'm like, I said to Dr. Rogers, where did he go? And then where he was was in the hallway. He had pulled the student intern, um, this young man, out of the classroom, and he was in the hallway recruiting this student in turn to eventually come back to Baltimore County. So while you know he had the chair of the board and the superintendent in that room, he did not hesitate to leave that room, take that person out there, and really work on, I don't think that person had a chance, like, um, <laughs> but really work on why he should be a member of the staff. So just a, a, a great example, but we all, how do we get everybody to buy into it that it's all of our roles to recruit and to really um, talk up the system so that we have more people who want to come here um, to, to teach our kids. So just a comment. 
I know about that because he actually called me out of another classroom right. to come inter meet that right. individual. So I have the, his contact information. <laughs> Math education major. Right. Yeah. Okay, so that's an example. Other, Ms. Booker Dwyer. And just my last question um, around the BCPS career letter, that slide 12. <laughs> At some point, would we be able to get projected numbers so that we can start thinking about the budget for all of this um, since we're adding the 10000 So how much is all of that going to cost over the course of X number of years? So how many teachers are you anticipating supporting? Um, you know, so that'll be so just the next time this comes up, just to have some of the projections on who's going to the the projections on um, the percentage of teachers that you anticipate moving through the the levels over the course of um, several years. Any other questions or comments, Ms. Frampong? Um I had a question on the um, NBC teachers. There was the demographics as far as our administrators and um, our teachers, but what about NBC? Do we have any data as to what that breakdown is for the NBC educators? And just to clarify, what the data on number of NBCTs that we have currently? No, from slide six and seven, as we looked at the hiring data, um, slide six was school-based administrators, and there's a racial demographic, and then um, same thing for the teachers. And so I just wondered how that translated into our NBC teachers as well. Ms. Frimpong, while that data is not right here, it, it is something that can be compiled. Um, the numbers are small enough that we could identify Thank the you. racial demographic. Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay, thank you all for that informative presentation and for answering all of our questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Whoa, the next item on the agenda is informational items including quarter one audit report, and the revised superintendent's rules, 1100, 4100, and 5200. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda setting. Um, well, first we'll do committee updates, starting with audit. Mr. McMillian, any updates? Uh, our next meeting is Tuesday. November 14th at 4.30, and that's for the Audit Committee. And we broadcast live, so I encourage anybody that's interested to please tune in. Thank you. Thank you. Budget Committee, Ms. Dominowski. Uh, our next Budget Committee meeting is Wednesday, November 15th. Um, please join in. I don't have an agenda yet, but I will work on it soon. Thank you. Buildings and Contract, Mr. Young. Well, it should say Ms. Harvey. Ms. Harvey. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next building and contracts meeting is Monday, November 6th at 5 p.m. I'd like to thank our BCPS staff liaisons that uh, so patiently and diligently provide us with the information that we need to make good fiscal decisions, and we would hope that everyone would join us virtually. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Um, next is curriculum committee. Curriculum Committee, and that is me, and our next meeting is next Thursday. I'm laughing because we just had one yesterday. So our committee has been um, really spending a lot of time um, going in-depth in a lot of curricular issues, um, not issues, curricular information. Um, and I want to thank um, Dr. DiDonato and her staff because they are putting together very thorough presentations for us to look at ahead of time, um, and it's leading to very robust conversations and meetings every other week. So um, thank you. And again, all of the committee meetings are live or recorded um, for the public to view at another time. Um, equity Committee, um, I'll let Ms. Harvey as Vice Chair talk about that one. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. On behalf of our committee chair, Dr. Savoy, uh, I would like to bring forward uh, a proposal made by the Equity Committee. In our last meeting, we had a very robust discussion about how we as board leaders uh, implement policy 0100 and in our role as governance, uh, lead by example. 
and we are uh, proposing that the board, uh, the full board participate in required equity training to be conducted by our own BCPS um, Department of Equity at a, at a soon to be determined time. And so given that discussion that we had and our belief that this is in line with our very first policy, 0100, uh, I move that the full board participate in required equity training to be led by the BCPS Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. Thank you. Is there a second for Ms. Harvey's motion? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. No seconds needed since it's a recommendation of the committee. Okay, well, it, that's okay, my fault, but it came to me. Um, any discussion from board members? May we, may we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Dolosky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Ms. Drummond? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. I just have one f announcement. The Equity Committee will be meeting next on November 16th at 4 p.m. It is a broadcast and a virtual meeting, and so we invite everyone to attend. Thank you all so much. Thank you. The Legislative and Government Relations Committee, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Yes, yeah, so our first meeting will be on November 30th at 4.30 p.m. Thank you. And Policy Review Committee, Ms. Pumphrey. Our next meeting is Monday, November 13th at 4.30. And I also wanted to acknowledge that based on our discussion um, at yesterday's curriculum meeting um, regarding school libraries and selection of instructional materials, I did reach out to staff uh, for guidance and I will provide an update as soon as I have a response from staff. Thank you for that. Next is, next is board member comments and agenda items. Does anyone have a comment or agenda item they would like to mention at this point? Okay, then that part we are finished. And then the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next board meeting will be held on Tuesday, November 7th, 2023 at 630. And thank you for joining us tonight. And the, <laughs> the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs> Happy Tuesday, Dr. Ferrone. <laughs>